And we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another BP TV. And today we're all about how to get stronger for BJJ faster. So that's the thing, strength, it takes a little while. And oftentimes, like, you know, we're always talking about, like, do the work, be patient, etc. If you could get stronger faster, why wouldn't you? So that's what we're going to have a look at today. It's really important that you are doing some key things which are really going to improve this for you guys. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in uh, the comments on the side. And look, if you're coming to this video a little bit after the fact, you can also put questions underneath in the comments. I'll check the comments and then I can use those questions for a later live stream. So um, feel free to comment away. Now, quick overview, looking at how to get stronger faster. So I have been obsessed with getting strong my entire life, pretty much my adult life. And uh, it's harder than it seems, but there are a few things you can do which can really help you. So that's what today is all about, giving you easy to access things that are going to help you. So number one is the easiest thing you are not doing to get stronger. I, I would almost guarantee you guys are not doing this. Uh, why? Because it's pretty advanced in terms of knowledge, but it's pretty simple in terms of execution. So it's definitely something you can do, but you, you're not doing it yet. So then number two is the best time for you to lift in order for you to get stronger. So this is actually different for everybody. And I'm going to break down exactly how we work out for you. What is the best time for you to get stronger? Um, now, I have extensive notes here. <laughs> I'm, I'm running a little late because I actually, uh, I always write notes. I do a degree of research every time before I get on here to make sure I do a certain amount of fact checking. Um, and also, I don't want to give you guys misinformation. I will give you the, the closest thing I understand to the scientific literature and look, if that's wrong or that gets updated, I'm always happy to admit I'm wrong. So if I ever mention something on here and you're like, ah, that's questionable. What are you saying that for? Then, um, and you can go and find some other information. I'm always happy to discuss and explain why I say what I say. Uh, so I have extensive notes here. And so I will be constantly referring to those notes. Um, now, number three is uh, the two things to improve to boost your strength. And these two things are things that we don't always pay attention to, but they are vital to us as people who do jiu-jitsu. If you do jiu-jitsu, you need these two things without, without exception. Um, now, number four is the minimum effective dose. So your MED, what is the least you can do to get the best result? So what is it and how does it get you stronger faster? And then number five, which is very key, is slow and fast lifting. Now, there's, it's not even a debate, really. It's really uh, both of them are good options, but we need to understand when should we use slow and fast lifting? And we're referring to tempo is how fast you move the bar, the kettlebell, the dumbbell, whatever weight you're lifting, the sandbag, even your own body weight. And then why? What are they good for? Like, why would I do slow lifting or slow tempo lifts versus why would I do like a plyometric, like a box jump or an explosive movement? And it's trying to understand where that fits in for you as someone who's trying to get stronger. Okay, so let's kick it off. My squeaky chair in the background. Um, let's kick it off, guys. First things first, having a look at the easiest thing you are not doing to get stronger. Now, like I said before, if you have any questions not related to this topic, feel free to just pop them in the questions or when you tune in, you see this, feel free to just say, hey, what's up? And just let me know you're out there because sometimes I see that I've got some people watching and then I, <laughs> and then after 10 minutes, they get bored and they leave. <laughs> no, it's not, not always that way, but uh, yeah, definitely let me know uh, if you have any questions. So the easiest thing you are not doing. So a lot of us out there might be putting it in our phone. We might be, you know, putting some sets and reps in our phone. We might be writing it down in a journal. 
But here is something that you are not doing. It's called tonnage. It's measuring the total weight you moved in the workout. Now, this is more advanced. They do this at Westside Barbell, which is a hardcore powerlifting gym in the States, which is headed up by Louis Simmons, who's a legend of the iron game. Uh, he actually even went to Russia and did some trainings there um, and has produced some of the strongest humans in the history of humans. Uh, but not just Louis Simmons, but they do this at advanced sporting programs where they will calculate uh, how much weight you've lifted in a given session. So I'm going to give you an example now, and I've already done the math on it, so I don't stuff up and steer you wrong. I'm going to give you an example of a deadlift, guys. So just a basic deadlift, and we think that you're deadlifting 100 kilos, and you're doing it, you're doing five sets of eight times 100 kilos. So that means you've literally done 40 reps of 100 kilos, which makes it 4,000 kilos as a total of your tonnage. Does that make sense? So if you're measuring that in your total workout, that's what we're looking at. So then let's say you come back the next week and it's the same cycle, same workout, and you think, oh, I feel pretty good. You go, right, I'm going to do one more rep each set. So you're doing five sets of nine times 100 kilos. You Once you've completed that, you will have done four and a half thousand kilos. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Then the following week, you come back, you're on the same cycle. You think, I'm just going to add one more rep. So now you're doing five sets of 10 at 100 kilos. This makes 5,000 kilos total volume for that workout. You're getting stronger, right? You're moving the same weight, but by adding one rep each time, you are actually getting stronger. And then by the fourth week, you know, you just get gained. You're just feeling strong as you do five sets of 12 at 100 kilos. Now, five sets of 12 is a lot. Let's just say that right now. That's 60 reps. That's a lot of volume. Um, it'll it'll knacker you out, but you've done 6,000 kilos. So if we compare week four to week one, you have now done 50% more total volume. Your first week, you did 4,000 kilos total for that particular lift. And by the end of it, you're doing 60 so you're doing 6,000, you've done 60 reps, 6,000 kilos. That's a 50% total volume increase in a month. That's a lot. Now, what I'd say to you is we only really want maybe like a 10% a volume increase. So, but, but this is very reasonable. Lots of people experience this all the time. So you are definitely stronger, even though you haven't put more weight on the bar, you have done more with the weight. And this is what my old coach, Ifim, used to refer to as milking the weight. You are definitely getting stronger, even though you're not putting more weight on the bar. So now when we go to week five and we skip ahead, we are going to actually drop the, the, the reps back down to five sets of eight, but you're going to do it with 110 kilos. So 110 kilos for five sets of eight will give you 4,400 kilos total tonnage. And as you incrementally work your way through this, you know, you get five by nine times 110, you've got like 5,300 kilos. Like you are gradually more and more, even just by incrementally increasing one rep or 10 more kilos, you're getting hundreds of more kilos of load in your body. This is how you get stronger. Now, if you're not writing this down, this isn't just some, I can't remember my tonnage <laughs> from like, six weeks ago off my squat program. Like I couldn't, I can't tell you off the top of my head. That's why I always write it down in my diary because I'm not going to remember even week to week. I have to go back. Like I might've remembered like, oh, last week I felt good, but I don't know exactly what it was. So here's the thing, guys. If you're not writing it down and doing this basic math of sets times reps times weight moved, you're not going to know your tonnage. Actually, I'm going to put that in the comments. So I've got this written down on my bit of paper here. Here are my notes. Anyway, I'll just flash them across the screen. As you can see, I've, I've written some pretty decent notes. So I always prepare for this. So it's sets times reps times kilos equals tonnage. 
I may have spelled that wrong. Not plus Tanishka. My typing is terrible. Equals, equals. Boom. Sets times reps times kilos equals tonnage. Now you guys can use this. Like I said, it's advanced, but this is how I program for my personal clients. So if you ever come to Jungle Brothers and you work with me and I'm trying to get you strong as hell, I'm always going to look at your total tonnage or your time under tension. And these are variables. So once you start doing this and you start writing this down and you start looking at it, it's going to make a big impact on how strong you get. And it's actually easy. It's just as simple as some basic mathematics to understand what the bloody hell you're doing. Awesome. We're going to roll on. Number two, the best time to lift to get stronger. Now, for each individual, this is different. Man, woman, and child. And you've got to play with it to understand. So let's look at three basic types of person. Now, I'm going to generalize here, not because this is the hard science, but you will understand what I'm saying when I, I reference this. So we all know the early bird, right? So we have people similar to myself who've been getting up early since I was quite young. You know, my mom used to get me out of bed. She like <laughs> knocking on the door. Are you up yet? And I'll be like, mom, I'm sleeping. Go away. And then she'd be like, that's fine. And she'd get the vacuum and she'd get the vacuum. I'm like, mom, fuck you go. She's like, don't worry about me. You sleeping. I'm just vacuuming here. I'm like, ah. And then what she would do, this is her mean trick. My mom would open my window just a little bit and my bed, was right next to my window. She would just open my window. So it's like in a cool breeze. And you're, ah, you try and pull the cover up over your head. And she would be watering the garden. I'm not kidding you. This is real. And she would run the hose over the window and it would go as the water went against the window. And where the window was open, a bit of water would spray through and hit me. I'm like, ah, I get so mad. And I would just wake up and uh, I couldn't go back to sleep. And I was like, damn it. It was like, you know, before seven o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. And I was like, damn, i got to get up now. You know, I couldn't go back to sleep. So I'm very conditioned to get up early. Like I get up 4 a.m. during the week. And on the weekends, I usually sleep in to about 6.30, 7 o'clock. That's my sleep in. Now that's the early bird. So then we've got the night owl, like my partner. She loves to sleep in, but she's most productive later in the day. So really for her, the first half of the day, it's not her best time to be productive. And she finds that she's way better kind of after 3 p.m. through to like, say, midnight. And that's fine because everyone's circadian rhythms are a bit different, even though um, as human beings, uh, we're meant to kind of get up with the sun, go down with the sun. Everybody's body clock is different. And then you get another group of people who are actually most productive in the middle of the day. They're a bit kind of dopey in the morning and they're not that good at night, but you catch them in the middle of the day and boom, they're making it happen. So they're like a, a hummingbird. You know, they've got that high energy when the sun is out. Now, what, what does this mean for your strength training? Which of these three types are you? Are you an early bird? Are you a night owl? Or are you a hummingbird flitting around, hitting all them flowers, getting that honey? Uh, think about it, guys. When you are freshest is when you're strongest. So let's relate this back. Um, I generally am better in the first half of the day. Like, even though I've done my PBs generally in the afternoon, that is usually after a nap. When I say PB, I mean personal best or a PR, which is a personal record. When you break your records for a maximum lift, whether it's a squat, a deadlift, a get up, anything, right? I know in myself that if I'm lifting consistently and I'm sleeping well, I'm strongest usually before lunch, probably about 11 o'clock, to be honest. I have done a lot of PBs in the afternoon, but I need a nap first. Now, not all of us can afford the luxury of a nap because you've probably got a job or children or a life, whereas I'm just living in the gym, right? So I just factor in whatever I can, uh, whenever I can. But I know myself that even though I'm very strong in the afternoon, I'm freshest in the morning. When are you freshest? You may find you feel really good to work out at night. So you've got to fit it in when you can. Some people have no choice. They're like, the only time I can work out is the morning. Well, you just got to do what you can. But then for some of us out there, if you get a decent lunch break, you can get a cheeky workout in at lunchtime. But here's a little side note on that. If you're training jujitsu three days a week, I would generally encourage you to lift on non-jujitsu days. 
So you have all your energy just for that workout. The biggest mistake you can make is do jujitsu and then lift. Never do that. That is going to deplete your nervous system. It's going to put you in a weaker state and you're going to get less benefit from your training. For you to be stronger, the best time for you to get stronger is when you are freshest. Cool. So I want you guys just to have an experiment, have a play. You might find that your time of day when you work out the best isn't when you're working out now. And you need to make that change if you're serious about getting stronger because that's what we're talking about right here. Number three, the two things to improve, the two things you can improve to boost strength. So let's say you already lift. Let's say you already consider yourself to be a strong person. And you're like, but how, how can I get better? How can I get stronger? There's always someone stronger than me. I want to be the strongest person in on the mat, in the building. You want to be a titan, right? There's two things you can improve right now that you, you probably are not spending much time on, which will make you stronger in a really short space of time. Now, we're talking about getting stronger faster. I'm saying if you do this in one month, four weeks, you will be significantly stronger. No lies. This isn't some fake guarantee. This is like literally, if you stick to this, you will be stronger. Okay, what are they? Number one, grip. Number two, core. Let's break that down. So for those of you out there, jujitsu is all about grip, whether you're in gi or no gi. Even though the gripping is very different from gi to no gi, you still need grip. No gi is much more kind of open chain gripping, if that makes sense. It's not like full crimp, it's part crimp. And then gi gripping is like closed, it's full closed. These are very different styles of gripping. Plus, we know no gi is slipperier and you have to re-grip and cup and do a variety of things, whereas gi is like full grip and it's grind and it's a lot slower and tougher in that way. So how do we improve our grip? There are three ways we can improve our grip very quickly in a short space of time. Number one, we have to improve the endurance of our grip. How do we do that? Hanging. Hanging is the simplest thing you can do to improve the strength of your grip. In the same way people do planks or people do like squat holds or like wall, wall chairs to improve the endurance of their legs, if you want to improve your grip, you need to hang. So you just build up the amount of time you're hanging. You do this at the end of your workouts when you are pretty gassed. You set the timer or you look at the clock and you just, you're just hanging in there. You're looking at the clock. You're just like, oh, come on, 30 seconds. And you're just going to build that up. You do three sets of maximum hang. So I'm actually talking like straight arm hang, um, like more or less passive, but like, you know, a little bit of scap engagement. You don't want to be like this. But don't worry about like bent arm hang. We're focused on the grip. Now, three sets of max. Simple as that, guys. You do that every time you work out. At the end of your workout, you are going to get a stronger grip. But that's more for grip endurance, strength endurance. Now, if you're trying to build those forearms, you're trying to get them, get them just huge jacked forearms, um, the two movements you can really work on, which are going to help your forearms grow, and this is around sets and reps as well as, excuse me, you've got to have good nutrition, um, but that's basic. Eat to win, hashtag eat to win lifestyle. Ask Joey all about it. Um, farmers carry and bottoms up cleans. So we've done bottoms up press in the um, in the kettlebell program in Bulletproof for BJJ. But when you clean the kettlebell up and squeeze and grip, that really works your forearm and your core. So just doing those bottoms up cleans and, and bring it to that position, laying the kettlebell down, bring it back up and coming to that bottoms up position works the hell out of your flexor and extensor muscles at the same time to stabilize your elbow. And this is really great. When you're working like eight to 12 repetitions on that, guaranteed you're going to get development in the forearm. So also farmer's carry is a great way to finish off a workout. Even though it seems similar in terms of grip endurance, because you're walking, there's actually a dynamic tension in your hands from you having to hold still and hold the heavy weight in your hands. So whether you're using kettlebells, dumbbells, farmer's carry bars, you know, there's the specific tools for that. Um, or maybe you're holding plates, you're doing a plate pinch. This has a fantastic way of just absolutely skyrocketing hypertrophy in the forearms. And I would encourage you guys to finish off with three, set, three sets 
of anywhere from one to five minutes. Oh yeah, believe that. So you might start off with a minute and do three sets of a minute, build it up to three sets of two minutes. And then ultimately we'd love you to try and do one set of five minutes, which is what I used to do, which absolutely beasted up my grip and really grew my forearms significantly. Now, the last thing for grip is maximal strength. Now, I've broken this down for you guys before, but I, I believe that this is absolutely the two key things that you can do. Number one is captains of crush grippers. Now, if you don't know what captains of crush are, just Google it. I know some friends of mine out there message me after I talked about the captains of crush and they've got some shout out. Uh, I'm going to be posting some training footage of me working on them pretty soon. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And if you have no access to captains of crush grippers, that's cool. Heavy deadlifts is one of the best ways to train your grip. So we're talking below five reps. So three to five reps on deadlift is one of the best ways to maximally train your grip. Cool. Okay, core. Now, a lot of people talk BS about, oh, core training is BS. Like they, they, it's kind of thrown a lot of shade by the strength conditioning community because they're like, oh, if you do deadlifts and squats, your core will be strong enough. Well, it's like, uh, that's not entirely true because jiu-jitsu is very dynamic. So you need to be able to create extension, flexion, rotation. You have to be able to do all these movements with your core while somebody's hanging off you. That's very dynamic, which requires a degree of training. You can't just get that training in jiu-jitsu. You can, but if you want to get really strong really quick, you have to train all those muscles between your ribs and your pelvis, front to back. So to improve your core endurance, we're going to say hollow bodies and hollow backs. So if you don't know what a hollow body is, there's varying levels to that game, but really you're going into a tuck position and you're going into extension with your arms and legs. Whoop. Okay, that wasn't a very good demonstration. But essentially, if you Google hollow body, you put it in YouTube, you'll see it. We actually have it as part of the body weight as part of Bulletproof BJJ. Hollow body level one, level two, and level three. This is a static hold position to brace through the anterior part of your core. Now, if you flip that around and you lie on your stomach and you lift your arms up and you go into extension and you lift your legs up off the ground as well, then you're doing like a hollow back hold. And this is going to work all the muscles through your posterior chain. This is amazing for really getting your glutes, hammies, lower back, upper back, shoulders strong in the same way from front to back. Now, I guarantee you, if you do, if you can do a minute of like hollow body and hollow back holds, oh my goodness, your core is going to get dramatically stronger. We're talking three by one minute of each. Super tough. You put that on the end of your workout, you're going to get much stronger through those bad boys, that midsection. Now, if you're trying to actually grow the muscles of your core, now this sounds strange, right? Because people are like, oh, I don't want big abs. Well, actually, if you do jujitsu, big abs are essential. <laughs> sounds strange. You're like, oh, I don't want to look weird. I don't want to look like I got a, a bubble gut. That's why someone said to me just the other day, I said, oh, you got a bit of a bubble gut, <laughs> a bit of steroids. And I was like, bro, I've just been eating food, man. <laughs> and I got big abs. I never take a steroids in my life, but I've done a lot of sit-ups and I have created hypertrophy around my abdominals. So it kind of, my abs poke out, unfortunately, bigger than my chest. I need, I need a man's zia. I need like a padded man bra, make me look like I've got more chest. You know what I mean? That would be handy. Uh, if you want to invent that product, I'll buy it. Slash, I probably need to do more chest. Anyway, whatever. Um, heavy grips are a cheaper version of Captain's of Crush. Adrian, my man, are they any good though? I've never used heavy grips. I've only ever used Captain's of Crush. Or I had a friend of mine try to give me really crappy foam version. Like just you could do a million reps and it was crap. So the question is, are heavy grips quality? I'm just putting it out there. Let me know. If they're good and they're cheaper, hey, try that out. I'm not trying to get you guys, you know, extortioned out by uh, Captain's of Crush because they got a brand name, you know? Um, now, if you want your abs to grow, if you want to actually get strong through the front, toes to bar, my friends. Now, that's where you're hanging from a bar and you're lifting your legs straight up to touch the bar. Now, if you can't touch the bar, you can just go to 90 degrees. But here's the deal. No swing. 
We don't want any momentum. We want it all controlled. And this is super key to actually developing the muscles of your midsection is the control factor. So to get hypertrophy and develop through the front of the tummy, like through the front of the midsection, I should say, um, and we're talking about uh, rectus abdominis, basically the abs, also hip flexors too, um, toes to bar is king. Now for maximum strength development of your core, we're going to look at either say a toes to bar hold, which is super tricky, which is where you bring your legs up to the bar and you hold them there as long as you can. Now I'm telling you, I've done these. And even right now, I would say I would max out at five to 10 seconds and I would, be, I would blow out. I do one set of five, pardon me, of five to 10 seconds. And then I just, I have to recover for about a minute or two before I could even try and attempt it again. It is so demanding. Another way that you can do this for your posterior chain is by doing a, a back extension, holding a plate and, and, and holding that for as long as you can. So um, for those of you who are not necessarily familiar, uh, you've probably got a back extension machine at your gym and uh, essentially you hook your heels under or if you've got a very good gym, you've probably got a GHD, which is a glute hamstring developer. And that's where you can lean forward and come up into full extension. If you're holding a weight and you get up to like, not full extension, but almost, and you hold that as long as you can, like no more than 10 seconds, your hamstrings are probably cramped, your lower back might seize up and your glutes are just going to go and really fire up. This is a great way to develop maximum strength through the posterior um, portion of your core. So front, Toast to bar hold, and then back, back extension hold with a weight. Now, if you can barely do back extensions, you'll probably just struggle to hold your own body weight there. So maybe start there. But like I said, guys, you've got to get better with your grip and your core if you really want to get strong fast. Um, number four, getting the minimum effective dose. So how do we get the most results from the least amount of effort? And I'm going to tell you, right now. This is um, something which a lot of people don't talk about because we're always trying to do more. It's like more is better. I'm going to tell you right now, more is not better. Uh, if anything, I actually started to get dramatically stronger when I started to train a bit less. So for me, I used to train every day, like every single day, seven days a week, I was in the gym lifting weights. And I was doing jujitsu about five days a week as well. And that is too much. I was definitely doing too much because even though I felt fit and strong, I wasn't as strong as I wanted to be. And it's like about getting there, getting up. So what I found was when I reduced my training to training weights three to four times a week with more recovery and then training jujitsu three to four times a week and just let my body recover more, I was better on the mat and I was better in the gym. So for me, Four and four is kind of like my minimum effective dose. That might be very different for you. If you're somebody who trains jujitsu three, maybe four days a week if you're lucky, and you're in the gym twice a week, here is how to do minimum effective dose, MED. Now, you might hear this more and more, and I hope you do, because they mention this in other fields of expertise in terms of medicine, uh, learning, and then also just productivity in general. So if you're into that life hacks kind of mode and you want to know how to improve your life, you've got to work out how you can get the best result for the least input. So if you train two days a week, say you're doing the Bulletproof BJJ program and you're doing Mondays and Wednesdays or you do jiu-jitsu Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So Tuesdays and Thursdays are your lifting days. Let's just say hypothetically that is the deal. I would encourage you to have your heavier lifting day earlier in the week because then your second day is your slightly lighter day. Let me explain how you can do that. Now, on your first lifting day, I would encourage you to, if you feel fresh, put a little bit more weight on the bar. Or as I was saying before, with improving your tonnage, add a few more reps to make it harder for you, right? But then on your easier day, so day two, I would encourage you to potentially reduce the weight and maybe do a few more reps 
or keep your sets and reps the same and give yourself more rest. Giving yourself more rest time will actually improve your quality, which means your bar speed will be higher. And we're going to talk about tempo in a second. And you will feel better in every single lift, giving you better technique, which means you will actually hit the muscles you're working on. When you get tired and your technique gets sloppy, you start to compensate. And then you're actually not going to deliver the way you should in terms of execution. We don't want you to develop all these compensatory movement patterns. We want the technique that you're doing to be executed to the highest quality possible. If you're falling apart and getting sloppy, you're not doing it right. So here's the deal, guys. You train, you lift, you're in the gym or you're at home, you're lifting twice a week. You need a heavier day and a lighter day. The way that you would run a heavier day, hypothetically, is to either up the weight slightly or up the reps slightly. But then on your easier days, you either reduce the weight slightly or keep the weight the same, but give yourself more rest. Fully recover between sets and you will lift better. This is the minimum effective dose. If you're only lifting once a week, it's not like, it's just not going to help you that much. It's kind of like jujitsu. If you only do jujitsu one day a week, you know what that, you know what that means? You suck. You're going to, you're going to go to jujitsu and you're going to be like, man, I suck a lot. And everyone's going to be like, yeah, you do. And then you go home and have an existential crisis. Like you need to make sure that if you are at jujitsu, you are learning and practicing a, practicing a skill once a week is not enough. Strength is a skill two times a week is your minimum effective dose. Now let's talk about it. Slow and fast lifting. This is point five and this is when should I do slow or fast lifts and why the bloody hell am I doing them? So if you want to get stronger for BJJ faster, you need to incorporate tempo. Now, Joey and I spoke on this recently in our podcast and Joey was saying your default mode should err on the side of slower. Why? Let's explain that. Now, the reason why slower is better when you first start lifting is because it increases your time under tension. And this is what strengthens your tendons and ligaments. And strong tendons and ligaments is what saves you from injury in the game of BJJ. One of the biggest problems with people who take steroids, now I know I talked about steroids last week, so I'm not going to bang on too much. But understand this, guys, when you take steroids, your muscles grow really fast, but your tendons and ligaments that are connecting you know, the tendons which connect the muscles to the bone and the ligaments which connect the bones to each other do not have enough time to adapt to these new big muscles. These new big muscles can lift more weight, but the connective tissue isn't strong enough. And that's why often you see people take steroids, get a pec tear or a biceps tendon tear, or many, like they will get many different muscular tears because their muscles are bigger and stronger, but their connective tissues are not right? So when you first start in the kind of, say you've never done lifting, you should always lean towards more time under tension. So what does that mean? Instead of just doing a squat like that, like just down up. Now there's benefits to going fast, but I'm going to explain that in a second. You should actually breathe in, come down, count of two, come out of the bottom of the squat as quickly as you can, but make sure you're controlling the lowering phase. Same thing with a, a deadlift. Come up as quick as you can. Like come up, accelerate the bar, but control it on the way down. Don't just bang it down. Why? I'm going to explain why. You're building the foundation. You are building your house of strength on a strong foundation. Time under tension builds the foundation for strength. So once you've been doing this for a number of months, even years, and you have control, then we can start to use speed. So what does fast lifting give us? Fast lifting gives us activation and advanced recruitment. If we're trying to get more fibers on board, do something dynamically. If you want to get more recruitment, like if you're trying to get greater muscle fiber recruitment for more power production, move fast. Sprinting, plyometrics, jumping, um, sled pushing, sled dragging, like anything where you can grit your teeth and work really hard. Think of a sprawl. Think of when you shoot in wrestling. All these dynamic actions, they require maximum nervous system recruit. But if you have not laid the foundation, the house will crumble. 
you should know that being faster is helpful, but you have to have a strong foundation in order to go fast. If you do not have strength, you cannot be powerful. Strength or power is strength at speed. It's strength times acceleration. Force equals mass times acceleration. Like that's that's the that's the equation, right? F equals ma. Force equals mass times acceleration. So if you if you speed up the movement and you don't have control, you're going to get an injury. Over time, I mean, maybe when you start, you're fine, right? You're doing box jumps. Hey, it's good fun. But then after a while, you might develop a bit of pain in the front of your knee. Before you know it, you've got a bloody tendinopathy, which just basically means your tendons can't handle the tension you're putting on them. And then you can't even walk properly. You can't even walk downstairs. That's what going too fast, too quick does for you. So guys, think of this. Going slow sets the foundation. And once you can control the weight, you can kind of build the weight up and move it a bit more. But once you've built strong foundation, you built the house, moving fast or lifting fast builds the second story on your house. You know, But if you don't have the main body of the house and you don't have a foundation, you can't build a second story. Going slow is for when you're first getting into strength training. And even advanced lifters do slow tempo squats, pause squats, etc., to develop great levels of strength. I do them too, but it's a phase. And once you pass through that phase and you've built yourself that foundation, you've got the house, then you're ready to add speed. And then you can go there and add that second level. But know that if you're early to lifting, go slower. If you're a bit more advanced, you've been lifting for a couple of years and you're trying to take the next step, then you can look at plyometrics, then you can look at bands, then you can look at acceleration, and that is going to give you access to greater recruitment, greater muscle development, and overall greater strength. So depending on where you're at, guys, and that's what this is all about, I'm going to sum this up right now. If you don't know where you're at, if you're like, look, I kind of been throwing the weights around. I don't really know what I'm doing. I want to do the Bulletproof BJJ program, but I'm not sure how it fits in with me. Just to ask us, guys. Tune in, ask us, and we can let you know because maybe you're at a stage where you want to do something, but you're not quite ready. Or maybe the Bulletproof BJJ program will be perfect for you. But if you're not sure, just ask us because we're not always going to say do it. <laughs> Even though you would think we would, Sometimes you're not in a good place to be able to do it. So, uh, and also you might have to do some rehab first. And that's the thing, guys. That's what's coming next. So I'm going to wrap up now. Um, but all I want to say is the standards program will be out. Then not long after that, just around Christmas time, we'll be dropping our rehab section. So that is top to toe, ankles, knees, hips, back, like low back, um, wrists, elbows, shoulders, neck. The whole piece, guys, we are going to be doing rehab, rehab at top to tail. So if you have any questions around rehab, next week I'm going to get deep on how you can approach coming back from injury. Because recently we had a good friend of ours post about tearing his ACL and having swelling in the knee and all kinds of problems. And what do you do when injury strikes? This is one of the biggest problems in jiu-jitsu and we often don't know what to do. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Not many comments today. That's okay. Um, I always like to hear from you guys. So um, thank you for taking this time out. I know you could be anywhere else in the world, but you're here with me and I appreciate that. And uh, if you have any other questions that are unrelated to this topic, go to our Facebook page, which is Bulletproof for BJJ Community. And also feel free to just ask any random question. I, I teach Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, that's my job. Full-time job is as a jiu-jitsu coach as well as being an SNC coach for jiu-jitsu athletes. So if you even have questions around training BJJ, please let me know. Stephen, thank you. Adrian, thank you. And for all of you out there, you see us later. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, both Joey and I really appreciate it. So guys, if you have any other questions, hit us up on Facebook, hit us up on Instagram. We're accessible and we want to help. All right. Thanks, guys. And between now and when I see you next, stay strong, but then also bulletproof.